simply entitled Changing the Scorecard. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians chapter 2, beginning with verse number 19, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. Today, in this room, we have many different households. There's the Dixon household. There's the Stevens household. There's the Hale household. There's the Turner household. And we could go on and on. However, for these households and for your household to grow, to be holy, to be God's habitation, to be vibrant, to, be, uh, to, to function properly, they must have Jesus Christ as its foundation. Likewise, the New Testament church is referred to as God's household. And if the local New Testament church is to grow, if it's to be holy, if it is to be God's habitation, if it's to be vibrant, if it is to function properly, it also must be built on a solid foundation, and that foundation, again, is Jesus Christ. And please remember, Paul here in Ephesians chapter 2 is not referring to brick and mortar, but to flesh and blood. So you see, your household is more important than your house. And God's people are more important than the building that they meet in. Why? Well, God is busy fitting or framing us together as his people and building his church as a missionary force for his kingdom. This morning, if you have ever built anything, you know it starts with a dream. After the dream comes the blueprint. The blueprint gives insight to how everything fits together in order for everything to be structurally sound. I remember the dream I had for the Life Center at Southport, the, the building, our worship place here. This summer, we will begin our 10th year here at the Life Center at Southport, the home of the Indianapolis Baptist Temple. But I remember when we lost our building some 14 uh, years ago, and, and I remember that uh, I, I came to the conclusion that possibly uh, we will always worship in rented facilities. And, and, I, and I thought to myself that probably uh, the rest of my life and the rest of my ministry, uh, I will never have a permanent place to call a church home. But in spite of that, I determined within my heart that I was going to just continue on and I was going to uh, go on and I was going to try to make the, the best out of it that we possibly could. And, and I didn't know who would stick with us and who wouldn't stick with us, but I just knew that we had to get up every day and just keep pressing on and moving on and pushing on no matter where we met, no matter where we worshipped. And that first five and a half years after we lost our, our property 14 years ago, uh, there was only one Sunday in five and a half years that we didn't have a place to go and worship together. And about half of you met in your small groups and the rest of you pulled up the covers and went to Bedside Baptist. But that only happened one time. Well, you've been to Bedside Baptist more than once, I know, but that only happened as far as that five and a half years, only one time. I remember in, that was 2001, I remember in 2002, I had always known of this building because our Christian school was just over here where the beauty school is now, and, and I've always been aware of this particular, particular building, and, and uh, I, I always liked this particular building. I, I, when it was a Rackets 4 Sports Center, I, I was only in it one time, and I was here with a guy, and I played racquetball, and I was only in it one time. 
But I knew that it had been sitting empty for, for a number of years. And, and even though they tried to sell it and they tried to get rid of it and they tried to even give it away, uh, no one really would even take it. They've, they, they offered it to other churches and no one, no one saw the beauty of it. And in 2002, we contacted me, and, and there was someone else with me. I can't remember who it was now, but someone else was with me, and, and uh, we contacted uh, the realtor that had this property, and, and we walked through it, and I'll tell you, you all remember what it looked like 14 or uh, uh, 10 years ago, didn't you? Uh, I mean, it, it was a mess. Uh, I mean, it, it was just a mess. I mean, when we started taking down the walls, I mean, there were, there were, there were actually bodies that came, came out of those, those walls that had been there, you know, mummified for many, many years. I mean, there, there were, there, I mean, I, I, we, had, we had enough tennis balls that came out of those walls. We could have, be, we could have become millionaires if we'd have sold them. This place was horrible. You look at some of the pictures on the wall out in the lobby and you look at the, the outside of it, it, it was horrible. And, and uh, we, we've taken video and, and I've just never taken the time to put it all together, but I, I need to do it one of these days and just remind ourselves of, of how ugly this building really was 10 years ago. But I remember walking through it in 2002 and I remember thinking, this is beautiful. This place could be beautiful. This place could really be nice. This is the place that I want to be. I didn't know if it was where God wanted us to be, but it's where I wanted to be. And I was hoping that where I wanted to be, God wanted to be. <laughs> and so we walked through with a realtor, and they said, well, we'll take $1.5 million for it the way it sits. Oh, my heart sunk because I knew, I knew we couldn't come up with 1.5 million. At least I didn't think we could come up with 1.5 million. I didn't have the faith that we could come up with 1.5 million. And then on top of that, try to renovate the place. It, it, it would have been nearly impossible. And so I left and I walk out, walked out the doors and everybody took off. And I just kind of walked around the property just a little bit and, and I began to pray. And I said, God, give us this building. This is, this is where we need to be. It just, it just, my heart's just telling me, this is where we need to be. I don't know how you'll do it. I don't know how you could do it. I don't know if you're going to do it. But I'm just asking, give us this building. It's the perfect place. It's the most perfect place on the south side of Indianapolis. And I left. Well, two years later, in 2004, we were meeting at Manuel High School, as you know, and they made us get out one, year or, or one, uh, one month early, if you remember. They were going to renovate the auditorium, and they said, I'm sorry, but you, you were going to stay here through May, but you can only stay here through April, and you, you've got to leave. And they only gave us a, a couple of weeks or so to, to, uh, to, to, to realize that. And, and uh, to be very truthful, I, it, kinda just, it just kind of made me mad. We're supposed to be there through 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 May. I wanted to be there through May, uh, but instead we, we had to go back early, a month early to Bird's Cafeteria. And it's not that there was anything wrong with Bird's Cafeteria. It's just, I don't know. I just, I just wanted to be there for one more month. We were supposed to be. That's what I wanted to do. But we had to get out a month early. The very first Sunday of May, we were back down at Bird's Cafeteria. We had the service. Service was over, and my family and I, we decided that we're going we're gonna to stay, and, and we're going we're gonna to eat it at the cafeteria, as we did many, many times, as many of you did. And so we went through the line. We got our food, and as I passed by a particular table and a particular couple to go to my table to eat, there was the owner of this building, Ethan Jackson, and his wife, Joyce. Now, I had never talked to them about this building. I had talked to someone else, the realtor, about this building. And, and so I, I stopped for a moment, and, and, uh, and, and really longer than a moment, and we began talking and, and, uh, and just conversing and how things are going. And, and finally, at the end, I said, uh, I said uh, you know, I know you have lots of property around the, the, the city of Indianapolis. We're, as a church, looking for a piece of property we can get into and we can rent, maybe renovate. And, and if you have anything, let me know. 
He says, oh, you need to look at, you need to look at the Rackus 4 Sports Center. That's available. Now, this is two years later. I looked at it in 2002. This is 2014. He says, you need to look at the Rackus 4 Sports Center. I said, well, I've looked at that, and we were quoted $1.5 million. And he and his wife both just looked down at their food as if they were kind of embarrassed over that price. Or sort of like, who in the world told them that? Because truthfully, they were ready to kind of bulldoze the place down. Nobody wanted it. He said, well, why don't you just call me sometime? I said, that's fine. So I said goodbye, and I went over, and I had my dinner. And uh, I, I wanted to give him a little time, you know, to digest our conversation. And he said to, to call him, you know, sometime. So I called him the next morning at 9 a.m. I have many problems, but procrastination is not one of them. My wife tells me most of the time I'm ahead of God. Among other things that she tells me. But we won't go into those. If we had not had gone back to Bird's cafeteria a month early, Perhaps, just perhaps, I would have never run into Mr. Jackson and just perhaps he would have never said, why don't you call me? And just perhaps I wouldn't have called him at 9 o'clock the next morning and just perhaps we would not have renovated this property and gotten into it and just perhaps we wouldn't even be here today. You see, you see, it takes a dream. Then it takes a blueprint and we, and we hired somebody to, to make up blueprints, and then we all came in here and did it ourselves and changed all the blueprints. But nevertheless, it started with a dream. And we came in here, and in 12 months, in 12 months, or let me go back. No, it took, it took 15 months just to jump through all the red hoops. And then once that 15 months was over, then it took us 12 months to get in here, and we had our first Sunday, our first service, the last Sunday of August of 2006. When I think back, think back on the last 10 years, it just have been, it's been an amazing journey. It's been an amazing ride. Sometimes people say, yeah, but you don't know how that hurt me when we lost our property. Well, just get over it. Look at the person next to you and say, just get over it. Say it again. Look at him. Say, just get over it. I want you to know, we wouldn't have what we have today. We wouldn't be doing what we're doing today. We wouldn't have the ministries that we have today if we stayed at 2711 Southeast Street. I'm glad that everything that happened to us was for his honor and for his glory and for our betterment and for our best. And I am so glad that we went through what we went through so that God could be honored and God could be glorified and he could give us his very best. So look at the person next to you. Come on, look at him. You've been wanting to say this, Jack, to Diane for years. We're giving you the opportunity. You've been, a, you've been a coward. You wouldn't say this, but you can say it in church. Say, Diane, just get over it. If you need a place to live, let me know. We've got an extra room. When we build, it starts with a dream. After the dream comes the blueprint. And the blueprint gives insight to how everything fits together in order for everything to be structurally sound. 
However, more importantly, now that the Life Center is built, is how we build God's people, how we build God's household, how we build God's church, how we build God's assembly. What's more important than even the building is how we build God's spiritual habitation. That's you and that's me. You see, measurements matter. Blueprints matter. Uh, How we build matters. Now, in the 1970s, the measurements of how a church was doing was determined by bodies and budgets and buildings alone. Pretty much. How many were here in the 70s? Some of us were. As long as we had bodies, we were doing good. As long as we had budgets and we were meeting our budgets, which we hardly ever did, we were doing good. And if we had buildings and they hadn't collapsed around us and we, and, and, and we, were, we were fixing them up and, and everything was all right, when we'll, well, it, it was good. I mean, the, the scorecard years ago was all about bodies and budgets and, and buildings. And, and let me say, bodies and budgets and buildings are important. We have bodies here today and we have budgets and we have buildings and, and all that's good. But I want you to know in 2015, we need a new scorecard. We need a new measurement. You see, as important and valid as bodies, budgets, and buildings are, we must in this 21st century, as we begin 2015, change the scorecard or what determines success in the church. So Hebrews chapter 10 tells us why we need a new scorecard. Take your Bibles, please, and open them to Hebrews chapter 10, if you will. And I want us to begin reading in verse number 19. Because it tells us, it tells us why we need a new measurement to build God's household. Why we need a new scorecard. You see, Hebrews chapter 10 tells us that bodies are important and budgets are important and buildings are important. But there's some things that are even more important than that. And if we, don't, if we have these three things but don't have the other things, then we're not going to be in this 21st century the, the household of God that he wants us to be. We're not going to be his spiritual habitation as we ought to be. You see, we can be a body and come to a building and participate in the budgets by giving and not be growing in the Lord. In this 21st century, we need a new scorecard. We need a new measurement of how the body is framed or fit together. And so Hebrews chapter 10, beginning with verse number 19, tells us why we need this new measurement, this new scorecard. It says in verse 19, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest of the blood of Jesus by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God. Now that we're saved, he says, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. You may be here today, but have you drawn near to him with a full, a heart in full assurance of faith? How's your faith level today? Oh, you're a body and you may be here, but how is your faith level today? It goes on and it says, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. You see, that's what we're doing here today. We're we're here as bodies. We're here as individuals so that we can be washed with the word of God. So our conscience can be washed with the word of God. Uh, How is our conscience? uh, uh, How are we getting along with God? How are we getting along with each other? Uh, how, How are we getting along with others? With God and man. We can come and as a body and we can sit in church and and not really like the person next to us or not really like the person across the way. How do we get along with each other? He goes on in verse 23 and says, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Not everybody has over these last 10 years. Not everyone has held fast the profession of their faith without wavering. There have been many over the last 10 years that have wavered. 
many that have wavered. You see, we need a new scorecard, don't we? He says in verse 24, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. The problem is we're all good provokers. <laughs> but it's just not always the good works. And in love, we, we provoke each other. We provoke each other to death sometimes. Sometimes we just feel like dying. Just be quiet. We, if we're going to provoke, we need to provoke each other to good works. In love, we, we, we need to encourage each other to not waver, to, 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 to draw near, to hold fast, to consider one another. We need to provoke each other to good works, unto love, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. What day approaching? The day of the Lord Jesus Christ. One day Jesus is coming again. Before he comes again, there is a thing called the rapture. And we need to get ready for it. And the Bible says that as we see the day approaching, the coming of the Lord, the rapture of the Lord Jesus Christ, of the, of, of the, of the saints, of his church, uh, I, I, we, we need to be in his assembly. His assembly is his church. It's the household of God. If we are not in his assembly, if we are not in his local church, when he comes, I'm not so sure we're not going to be left. Now don't call me a heretic. <laughs> well, you can if you want. Others have. But it says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves as you see the day of appro approaching. Because if we're not in his church when the day approaches and he comes again, I'm not so sure that he's going to take us at that particular time. I'm not so sure there isn't more, that more than one rapture in the Bible. In fact, I can prove there's more than one rapture. Now, what they all mean, you know, that's up to you and me to figure out. But there is more than one rapture in the Bible. So he says, you need to be in the local church. You need to be a member of the local church. You need to be participating in the local church. Because as you see the day approaching, when he comes, we need to be ready. You see, the local church is important. The local church is important to God. The local church should be important to us. You say, I don't like the local church. I can't help it. Jesus does. He died for it. I don't like all the people in the local church. I don't either, but I still come. Amen. In fact, I don't like you and you and you and you and you, but I still, I'm still here. He said, but I don't like the preacher. That's too bad. God hasn't called me away yet, so you're stuck with me. Amen. What does liking each other have to do with, in, have to do with, with, with being a part of his church? What's that have to do with anything? You, you go to work, you like everybody at work? You, ever, you quit your job? No, you're a hypocrite. You go to the store, you like everybody at the store? No, you're a hypocrite. Huh. It says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Some do. But exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. You can be saved. Know you're going to heaven. If you're not a part of the Lord's church, don't expect that he's coming back for you. Because he's coming back for his church. He's not coming back for individuals. He's coming back for his church. He's only coming back for individuals as it relates to us being one in the church. Nowhere in the Bible does it say he's coming back for you. He's coming back for his church. And we have to assemble in his church and be a part of his church so that when he comes back, he's coming for us. I know some of you don't believe that. That's all right. It's true anyway. 
whether you believe it or not, just keep assembling just in case I'm right. He goes on in verse 26, he says, for if we sin willfully, there are a lot of people just sinning willfully. They're not here willfully. They're not here purposefully. And you know what? You don't have to come here. You can find some other good Baptist churches to go to. You don't have to come here. I'll give you a whole list. I might visit a few myself. You never know. Just a little joke. If we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth. Have I told you the truth today? Yes, I've told you the truth today. Whether you believe it or not, I've told you the truth. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. <laughs> there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. He goes on, but a certain fearful looking for, uh, for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. You know what's going to happen to those that are in the church? They're going to be devoured. They, they better look for judgment. The fiery indignation of God. Let, let, me, let me say this. Someone who willfully doesn't come to church is an adversary of God. I don't care if it's your kid, my kid, your husband, my husband, my wife. <laughs> your relative, my relative. Your kid or my kid, I don't care who it is. The truth is still the truth. The truth is still the truth. When we don't, and we willfully, after we've known the truth, ignore the truth, and we sin, may I say, it is a sin not to come to church. Let me say that again. It is a sin not to assemble yourselves together. It is a sin not to come to church. Let me say it again. It's a sin not to come to church. It's a sin to depart from the faith. It's a sin to depart from the faith. It's a sin to depart from the faith once delivered to the saints. I believe it's a sin not to go to a New Testament Baptist church. Because I believe New Testament Baptist churches are the body of Christ. And out of that body will come the bride of Christ. And we will live in the New Jerusalem forever and forever and forever. And those that are not part of his church aren't going to live in the new Jerusalem forever and ever and ever. I didn't say they weren't in heaven. Don't look at me. Don't look at me that way. Don't look at me that way. Don't look at me that way. I didn't say they weren't in heaven. I'm telling you it's a sin not to be a part of a local church. I believe it's a sin not to be a part of a local New Testament Baptist church. It goes on, verse 28, he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite under the spirit of grace for we know him that hath said vengeance belongeth unto me I will recompense saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. Verse 31, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. He's not talking to unbelievers here. He is talking to believers. He's talking to Christians that, that, that need a new scorecard in their life, a new measurement for spirituality in their life. He's talking to Christians that are not 
holding to faith. He's talking to Christians that are sinning willfully. He's talking to Christians that are not in the local New Testament church. He's talking to Christians that are not pro pro provoking each other to good works and in love. He's talking to Christians that one day will stand at the judgment seat of Christ and receive the vengeance of God because of a life that was not well lived on this earth. That's what he's talking about. You say, oh, it's not important to come to church. It is important to come to church. Well, it's not important. It is important. It is important. If it's not, then let's go back to Bedside Baptist. I didn't want to get up today either. I got up because it's important. I'm not here because I'm a preacher. I'm a preacher because I'm here. The book of Hebrews, the author here, explains to us why we need a new scorecard. It's important that we're here. I'm glad that you're here. But there's some other reasons why you need to be here also. You see, God wants us to change. God wants us to be transformed. God wants us to grow in faith. God doesn't want us to waver. God wants us to, to willfully serve him. God wants us to provoke each other to good works. God wants us to do some things in our lives. He, he, doesn't, want us, he doesn't want to just save us uh, in, in verses 19, 20, and 21. He doesn't want to just save us with the blood of, by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and then we just come as a body in a building and, uh, and, and sit and, and not grow and not change and not be transformed. He wants us who have been here for 60 years to be different than when we got here 60 years ago. You who have been here for 50 years or 40 years, he wants you to be different today than you were 40 or 50 years ago. Those of you that have been here for 10 or 20 years, he wants you to be different 10 or 20 years later than you were when you first came. If you were here last week for the first time, I want you to know that God wants you to be different than you were last week. He wants us to change. He wants us to tra be transformed. He, he wants us to grow. He wants us to become more like him. But why are we still covetous? Why are we still jealous? Why are we still envious? Why are we still angry? Why do we still think we have a right just to say whatever we want to say to, whoever, to whomever we want to say it to? Why do we think we still have a right to be angry and mad all the time? Why aren't we ever changed? Why aren't we ever transformed into the image of his son, Jesus Christ? This morning, here's my point. Bodies, budgets, and buildings do not guarantee true transformation in Christian lives, in churches, and in communities. I want you to go back to Hebrews, and I want you to see what it says in verse 32. It says, But call to remembrance the former days in which, after ye were illuminated, ye endured a great fight of afflictions, partly whilst ye were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly uh, ye became companions of them that were so used. For ye had compassion of me in my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. God's going to reward you. For ye have need of patience. Oh, that's what we, that's what we need. Now, none of us want it. But that's what we need. We need patience. You see, transformation takes patience. Transformation takes time. Change takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God. See, all these things, if you want to do the will of God, all these things are the will of God. We need to do the will of God. We need to be people doing the will of God. Ye might receive the promise. 
For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, if we draw back, if we fall away, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Look at verse 39. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. Say amen. We are not of them that draw back to perdition. But of them that believe to the saving of the soul. You see, there's a difference in your spirit being saved and your soul being saved. And there's a difference in your spirit being saved and your soul being saved and one day your body being saved. There's a difference. Because our spirits are saved, we get to go to heaven. Period. Our souls will deter be determined if they're saved or not at the judgment seat of Christ, which will determine if we rule and reign with him. And one day in the resurrection, and some of us will have better resurrections than others because of rewards will be better than others. And one of these days in the resurrection, when we all rise, our bodies will be saved. Our bodies will be glorified. That's justification, that's sanctification, and that's glorification. I'm going to keep saying it until we get it. Justification is our spirit being saved. Sanctification is our soul being saved, our inner man, our, 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 our minds, our hearts, our, our, our feelings, our imaginations. The real us. And glorification is our body being saved. That's the whole process of redemption. You see, redemption is just not getting saved and going to heaven. There's a whole process of redemption. Body, soul, and spirit. You see, the author of Hebrews here is not talking to lost people. He's talking to saved people. And he says in verse 39, but we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. Do you know what the word perdition means? It means ruin. If we don't do these things, we're going to suffer ruin. You can have a big car and still suffer ruin. You can have a nice house and still suffer ruin. You can have a big bank account and still suffer ruin. You can be on top of the world, and if you don't do God's will, we're going to suffer ruin in this life or in the life to come, but we're going to suffer ruin. That's why the things of this life can't even compare to the things in glory that is to come. So we stay faithful because it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God for Christians. So we are not of them that draw back into ruin. I don't want to be ruined. I don't want to live all throughout eternity with my ruin because whatever rewards I get is all I'm going to get. But of them that believe to the saving of the soul. This morning, we need a new scorecard. We need a new measurement. And we need to ask ourselves this question this morning. How am I doing? How am I doing? Just ask yourself. How am I doing? Bodies, budgets, and buildings do not guarantee true transformation in Christian lives, in churches, or communities. And as a result, and in order not to suffer ruin, perdition, destruction, the loss of our soul, a new scorecard is needed. Or according to the LifeWay research team, a new transformational loop. Why don't you look on the big screen this morning? And we're not going to talk a lot about these today. We're going to next Sunday. But I want to just share with you very briefly the new scorecard. We need to discern. Discern if we have a missionary mentality or not. Then we need to embrace. We need to embrace vibrant leadership. We need to embrace relational intentionality. We need to embrace prayerful dependence. And then we need to swing around and we need to engage. 
We need to engage in worship. We need to engage in community. We need to engage in mission. Today, as I close, when we allow these three categories with the seven elements to permeate our lives, when we discern, embrace, and engage these principles, transformation, true change in your life and my life will occur. We need a new scorecard. And what is that new scorecard? People living like Christ. We can come here every Sunday morning and sit and not live like Christ when we leave. People living like Christ. What is the new scorecard? Churches acting like the body of Christ. What is the new scorecard? Communities impacted by the kingdom of God. And our city and our community will never be impacted until our church changes and until and our churches will never change and our church will never change until we change. Some of you this morning don't want to change. You just like yourself the way you are. <laughs> well, that's good because nobody else does. You need a change. I need a change. Our old sour attitudes need a change. We look like old sourpusses sometimes. We just need to change. We need to change. We need to be transformed. You see, this will be the new scorecard. Change will be the standard. Transformation will be the norm. As I said a few weeks ago, this sermon series is going to last for 12 months. <laughs> So just get ready. I'm not going to give you everything in one setting, everything in one Sunday. Next Sunday, we're going to tear apart this new transformational loop, piece by piece, principle by principle. And then we're going to expand upon it over the next seven or eight months. There are going to be little series within the series. Because we need change. We need transformation. And when Christians change, the church will change. And when the church changes, the community will change. And we'll get up and we'll begin doing what we're supposed to be doing. And we'll affect change in this world in which we live. As I said last week, the church needs to stop underachieving in this world. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ is one of the most underachieving institutions in the world today. And we need to stop underachieving in our own personal lives, in our families, in our marriages, at work, in our homes in our world, in our community. We need to stop underachieving. And we need to start achieving what Christ has changed us and transformed us to do and to accomplish. If we don't, we'll suffer perdition. If we don't, we'll suffer ruin. If we don't, we'll suffer loss. Not only as individuals, but as a church. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ has been established by God himself to do certain things that no other institution on earth has the capacity or the authority to accomplish. And you and I, we must get a new scorecard, a new measurement for how we are doing it's more than bodies, budgets, and buildings. When we get here, how are we really doing? Are we doing the will of God? Do we understand the will of God? Are we achieving and accomplishing what Christ would have us to achieve and have us to accomplish? This is why we're going to Mexico in July. This is why we're trying to raise money to build a new auditorium, a new church in the inner city. This is why we need a second floor in our Sunday school. 
This is, this is why that we're trying to accomplish the goals that we're trying to accomplish this year. That's why we've started Mercy House. That's why we're providing transitional living. We're trying to help people. We're trying to change communities. That's why I'm on the board for the Fuller Center for Housing. We're going to build three more houses this year, just trying to do something different in our community. That's why we're encouraging you to give a first fruits offering. So that we can accomplish what we feel God wants us to accomplish. I'm grateful for those that have given in the last three weeks over $20,000 to our first fruits offering. But we need so much more. Without everyone participating, we will underachieve. But with everyone participating, we can overachieve. And instead of one mission trip, we could take a couple mission trips. Instead of three building projects, we could have four or five building projects. We, we need desperately to fund our Young Champions program. It's really getting tight. I've got to do something. And this week I asked God to provide. We are his church. We are to accomplish his will. There's so much he wants us to do. And together we can achieve great things for him. Let's stand for prayer.